In many plant processes, certain physical conditions are subject to change. These changeable conditions are called process variables. And four of the more commonly monitored ones are pressure, temperature, level, and flow. But there's another group of process variables that are also commonly monitored in plants. They're called analytical variables. Analytical variables are based on the physical and chemical composition of materials. As with other process variables, it's important to understand how analytical variables can affect processes and how they're measured. Measurements of analytical variables provide operating personnel with valuable information about process materials before, during, and after a production process. Closely monitoring analytical variables is vital to producing an acceptable product. In fact, the general purpose of measuring analytical variables is to ensure that process requirements are met. For example, in a process where two substances are combined to form a solution, it's important for the proper proportions of the substances to be used. Closely monitoring the analytical variables associated with the process may prevent deviations that could lead to a defective product. Many analytical variables can be measured in industrial processes. Five of the more commonly measured ones are concentration, which is the amount of one material dissolved in another material in a solution, density, the weight per unit volume of a substance, clarity, the measure of how clear or transparent a substance is, humidity, the measure of how much water vapor there is in the air, and moisture, the measure of the amount of water in a solid material. By monitoring these and other analytical variables, operators are better equipped to control plant processes. Analytical variables are of value to operating personnel only if they can be accurately measured. Analytical variables are typically measured using instruments called analyzers. An analyzer measures and indicates physical or chemical characteristics that are based on the composition of a material. Analytical measurements can be obtained in different ways. One way is to take or grab samples from a process periodically and then analyze them in a laboratory. Another way is to monitor analytical variables continually. In either case, analyzers help ensure that product requirements are being met by monitoring characteristics of raw materials going into a process, changes that occur within the process, and characteristics of final products. For example, this clarity analyzer is used to make sure that a liquid going into a process is relatively free of contaminants. This pH analyzer is used to monitor the pH of a solution during a process. And this moisture analyzer is used to make sure that the moisture content of this final product is acceptable. Besides ensuring that product requirements are met, analytical measurements can also help keep the workplace safe. For example, an analyzer can be used to determine the concentration of oxygen in a confined space so that personnel will know if breathing gear is needed. Analytical measurements can also help protect the environment. For example, analyzers can be used to monitor waste gas that's being released from a stack and waste water that's being discharged into a lake or river. In this topic, we identified some of the more commonly measured analytical variables and we talked about why and how they're measured. Now let's try some practice questions that relate to this material. Many analytical variables can be measured in industrial processes. Five of the more commonly measured ones are concentration, which is the amount of one material dissolved in another material in a solution, density, the weight per unit volume of a substance, clarity, the measure of how clear or transparent a substance is, humidity, the measure of how much water vapor there is in the air, and moisture, the measure of the amount of water in a solid material. Analytical variables are typically measured using instruments called analyzers. An analyzer measures and indicates physical or chemical characteristics that are based on the composition of a material. Sometimes it's important to know the relative amounts of the substances in a solution. One way to do this is by determining the concentration of the substances. Concentration is basically the amount of one material dissolved in another material in a solution. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. That is, two or more substances, such as liquids or gases, that are evenly dispersed in each other. For example, these two beakers contain homogeneous mixtures of dye and water. 
But as you can see, the solution in the beaker on the right is darker than the one on the left. That's because the solution on the right has a higher concentration of dye. Concentration measurements can be expressed in different ways. Two ways that are commonly used are percent measurements and parts per million, or PPM measurements. Percent measurements express the amount of a material per 100 parts of total solution, either by weight or by volume. For example, if this solution of water and dye contains 10 ounces of dye, and the total volume of the solution is 100 ounces, then the concentration of dye is 10 parts per 100 parts of solution. 10 divided by 100 is 0 0.10 or 10 percent. So the concentration of dye is 10 percent by volume. Parts per million measurements express the amount of a material per million parts of total solution. 10 parts of dye per 100 parts of solution is the same as 100,000 parts of dye per 1 million parts of solution. The concentration of the dye then is 100,000 ppm. As a general rule, parts per million measurements are used for measuring very low concentrations of materials in solutions. Adding substances to liquids is common in many plant processes. When certain substances are added to a liquid, electrically charged particles called ions are formed. When this happens, the concentration of the substance in the liquid can be determined by measuring the liquid's ion concentration. The ion concentration of a solution can be determined by measuring the solution's pH. Specifically, pH is a measure of a solution's hydrogen ion concentration. In general, though, it's an indication of a solution's acidity or alkalinity. You see, acid and alkaline solutions contain hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. A hydrogen ion is a positively charged hydrogen particle. A hydroxyl ion is a negatively charged particle made up of oxygen and hydrogen atoms. The acidity or alkalinity of a solution depends on its concentration of hydrogen and hydroxyl ions. For example, an acid solution has a greater concentration of hydrogen ions than hydroxyl ions. The stronger the acid solution, the greater the concentration of hydrogen ions. An alkaline solution, or an alkali, has a greater concentration of hydroxyl ions than hydrogen ions. The stronger the alkali, the greater the concentration of hydroxyl ions. Pure water is neither an acid nor an alkali. In pure water, the concentrations of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions are essentially equal. Since there is no majority of either type of ion, pure water is said to be neutral. The acidity or alkalinity of a solution can be expressed on a pH scale, such as this one. On this scale, pure water is assigned a value of 7. From 7, the numbers on the pH scale increase to indicate increasing alkalinity and decrease to indicate increasing acidity. For example, a strong acid like sulfuric acid might have a value near 1 on the scale. A strong alkali like caustic soda might have a value near 14 on the scale. Now, one thing to remember about the values on a pH scale is that they can be misleading if they're taken at face value. That's because between any two adjacent numbers on the scale, the concentration of ions changes by a factor of 10, not by a factor of 1. For example, a solution with a pH of 1 has 10 times more hydrogen ions than a solution with a pH of 2. In some applications, it's possible to determine the concentration of a substance in a solution using the solution's pH. But to do this, you first have to be able to measure the pH. One way to do this is to use a device called a pH analyzer. The pH analyzer represented here has two electrodes which are submerged in a beaker of solution. The electrodes and the beaker of solution form what is known as an electrolytic cell. The two electrodes are connected by wires to a measuring device that has a pH indicator. The principle of operation for this pH analyzer is based on the fact that the electrolytic cell will produce a voltage in relation to the pH of the solution. The voltage output from the cell is then amplified by the measuring device and displayed as a measurement of pH. pH analyzers are used in many types of industrial processes. For example, they're often used for monitoring and controlling the pH of materials involved in chemical production processes. They're also commonly used to protect process equipment. 
For example, pH analyzers help prevent the water in this cooling tower from becoming too acidic or too alkaline and corroding equipment such as pumps and piping. The ions that are present in a solution have an important characteristic, the ability to conduct electric current. The ease with which electric current flows through a solution is the solution's conductivity. As the concentration of ions in a solution increases, that is, as the solution becomes more concentrated, its conductivity increases as well. For that reason, the concentrations of some solutions can be determined by measuring their electrical conductivity. This simplified illustration shows an electrical conductivity measurement system. The system includes a conductivity cell, which consists of a pair of electrodes or probes surrounded by a shield, and two wires which connect the electrodes to an electrical conductivity meter. During operation, an electric current passes through one probe, then through the solution being measured to the other probe, and back to the meter. The ease with which the current passes through the solution is measured and displayed as an indication of the solution's conductivity. In this arrangement, the conductivity value is indicated on the meter scale. But in some systems, the measurement is sent to a recorder where a permanent record of conductivity values can be maintained. Now suppose we put a different solution in the beaker and repeat the test. But this time, the pointer doesn't move as far up the scale. That's why the pointer didn't move as far up the scale, because the conductivity of this solution is lower than that of the previous solution. Now, the way a conductivity measurement is expressed can depend on the units of measurement that are used. For example, ion concentration is sometimes expressed directly, either as a parts per million measurement or as a percent value. But electrical conductivity can also be expressed using a basic unit called the mo. A mo, which is ohm spelled backwards, is the reciprocal of an ohm. While an ohm is used to describe a substance's resistance to current flow, a mo is used to describe a substance's ability to conduct current. Many conductivity analyzers use units of micromoles. A micromo is one millionth of a mo. But regardless of the scale that's used, conductivity measurements can serve a number of purposes in industry. For example, they're commonly used to check for dissolved solids in boiler water, which can cause scale buildup in boiler tubes. Dissolved solids increase the water's conductivity. If conductivity measurements indicate that the water has a high level of dissolved solids, operating personnel can change treatment procedures to prevent scaling in the boiler. During this topic, we talked about what concentration is, and we focused on how to determine liquid concentrations by using pH measurements and conductivity measurements. Now let's try some practice questions. Concentration is basically the amount of one material dissolved in another material in a solution. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. That is, two or more substances, such as liquids or gases, that are evenly dispersed in each other. For example, these two beakers contain homogeneous mixtures of dye and water. But as you can see, the solution in the beaker on the right is darker than the one on the left. That's because the solution on the right has a higher concentration of dye. The acidity or alkalinity of a solution can be expressed on a pH scale, such as this one. On this scale, pure water is assigned a value of 7. From 7, the numbers on the pH scale increase to indicate increasing alkalinity and decrease to indicate increasing acidity. The pH analyzer represented here has two electrodes which are submerged in a beaker of solution. The electrodes and the beaker of solution form what is known as an electrolytic cell. The two electrodes are connected by wires to a measuring device that has a pH indicator. The principle of operation for this pH analyzer is based on the fact that the electrolytic cell will produce a voltage in relation to the pH of the solution. The ions that are present in a solution have an important characteristic the ability to conduct electric current. The ease with which electric current flows through a solution is the solution's conductivity. As the concentration of ions in a solution increases, that is, as the solution becomes more concentrated, its conductivity increases as well. For that reason, the concentrations of some solutions can be determined by measuring their electrical conductivity. Oxygen concentration measurements can be important to many industrial processes. For example, oxygen analyzers are often used to measure the percentage of oxygen in boiler flue gases. Plant operators and control systems can use those measurements to maintain proper boiler operation. One type of oxygen analyzer that's used in industry is a paramagnetic oxygen analyzer. 
It operates on the principle that oxygen is attracted to a magnetic field. The paramagnetic oxygen analyzer represented here has a sample chamber and two sets of magnets, each of which creates a strong magnetic field. Suspended between the magnets is a glass test body or measuring device with a mirror attached to its center. The mirror reflects light from a light source onto a scale which provides a visual indication of the oxygen concentration of a sample gas. During operation, the gas being measured enters through the chamber's inlet. The oxygen in the gas is attracted to the centers of the magnetic fields and tries to force the spheres of the measuring device out of the magnetic fields. Looking down from the top, we see that this causes the measuring device to turn, which changes the angle at which the light hits the mirror. The point on the scale where the light hits indicates the percent oxygen value of the gas. Often it's necessary to monitor the concentrations of gases other than oxygen in a gas mixture. For example, many plants measure the concentration of a specific gas in a binary gas mixture, which is a mixture of two gases. An analyzer that's commonly used for this purpose is a thermal conductivity gas analyzer. Thermal conductivity is the ability of a substance such as a gas to conduct heat. The operation of a thermal conductivity gas analyzer is based on the fact that different gases have different rates of thermal conductivity. Argon, for instance, has a lower thermal conductivity rating than nitrogen. By measuring the thermal conductivity of a binary gas mixture, it's possible to determine the proportions of the gases in that mixture. For example, this thermal conductivity gas analyzer measures the concentration of argon in a binary mixture of argon and nitrogen. The analyzer has a meter and indicator that's connected to a thermal conductivity cell. The cell contains a sensing element or wire whose electrical resistance is sensitive to temperature change. During operation, electric current is passed through the wire, causing the wire to heat up. The analyzer is calibrated so that pure nitrogen will have virtually no effect on the temperature of the wire or the reading on the indicator. But when an argon-nitrogen mixture enters the cell, the argon causes less heat to be conducted away from the wire, and the temperature of the wire increases. The amount of increase depends on the amount of argon in the mixture. The temperature rise in the wire also increases the resistance to current flow through the wire, which in turn reduces the amount of current flow through the meter. The meter converts the change in resistance to a visual indication of the percentage of argon in the mixture. Some of the gas mixtures in industrial processes are complex gas mixtures. They contain more than two gases. And in some situations, it's necessary to measure the concentrations of the gases in these mixtures. One way to do this is to use an analyzer called a chromatograph. The chromatograph in this simplified illustration consists of a sample gas inlet, a supply of carrier gas, often helium or air, that's used to move or carry the sample gas, a tube or column that's filled with packing material such as activated carbon or silica gel, a thermal conductivity cell which measures the concentration of a gas in a mixture based on the gas's ability to conduct heat, and an indicating device, in this case a recorder. During operation, a sample of the gas being measured is fed into the chromatograph through the sample gas inlet. The carrier gas is then used to carry the sample gas through the column of packing material. Different gases flow through the material at different speeds. So the packing material separates the sample gas mixture into its individual gases. The separated gases then leave the column with the carrier gas and flow through the thermal conductivity cell. The identity and the concentration of each individual gas can be determined by how long it takes the gas to flow through the column and by its effect on the thermal conductivity cell. The recorder provides a visual indication of these measurements. The carrier gas is taken into account when these measurements are made. In this topic, we focused on the measurement of oxygen concentration, non-oxygen gas concentration, and complex gas concentration. Now let's try some practice questions that relate to this material. During operation, the gas being measured enters through the chamber's inlet. The oxygen in the gas is attracted to the centers of the magnetic fields and tries to force the spheres of the measuring device out of the magnetic fields. Thermal conductivity is the ability of a substance such as a gas to conduct heat. 
the operation of a thermal conductivity gas analyzer is based on the fact that different gases have different rates of thermal conductivity. Argon, for instance, has a lower thermal conductivity rating than nitrogen. By measuring the thermal conductivity of a binary gas mixture, it's possible to determine the proportions of the gases in that mixture. Some of the gas mixtures in industrial processes are complex gas mixtures. They contain more than two gases. And in some situations, it's necessary to measure the concentrations of the gases in these mixtures. One way to do this is to use an analyzer called a chromatograph. In a plant, vital process variables such as pressure, temperature, level, and flow are monitored and controlled by process instrumentation. By providing valuable information about process variables, instruments help operators to maintain safe and efficient control over plant processes. It's important for operators to have a good understanding of how process instrumentation works. Accurate level measurement makes it possible to ensure that proper amounts of materials are maintained in process systems. It also provides a way to determine the amounts of raw materials available for processing and the amounts of finished products or waste materials that are produced. Simply put, the level of a liquid or a solid is the position of the surface of that substance above or below a fixed reference point, often called the zero point. For example, if the zero point for this container of liquid is at the bottom of the container, then the level measurement is taken from the zero point up to the liquid surface. On the other hand, if the zero point is at the top of the container, then the level measurement is taken from the zero point down to the surface of the liquid. For some processes, you may need to monitor the level of a material continuously. Other times, you may only need to know when the level reaches a certain point. For that reason, level measuring instruments may be designed for continuous level measurement or single point level detection. Here's an example of continuous level measurement. In this arrangement, a gauge that's mounted at the zero line of a tank provides an indication of the level in the tank at all times. If the level rises, a pointer on the gauge moves up a scale to indicate the higher level. If the level drops, the pointer moves down the scale. Here's an example of single point level detection. In this arrangement, an electrical probe is used to detect a single predetermined level in the container. In this case, a high level. If the level of the liquid in the container reaches the predetermined point, the level measuring instrument activates a high level alarm. Some level measurement devices measure the actual level of a substance directly. These types of devices are called direct level measurement devices, and there are many types of them used in industry. One example of a direct level measurement device is a plumb bob. A plumb bob has a weight that's attached to the end of a reel of flexible measuring tape. To measure the level of liquid in a container, the weight is lowered into the container until it touches the bottom. The tape is then reeled back in, and the level is read directly at the wet line on the tape. This gauge glass, or sight glass, is another example of a direct level measurement device. It's a transparent vertical tube that's attached to the side of a tank. It's connected to the tank with pipes at the top and the bottom of the tube. The use of a gauge glass is based on the principle that liquid levels equalize in containers that are connected together. In other words, the liquid is free to move between the tank and the glass. So the level that's visible in the glass is the same as the level in the tank. Here's another type of direct level measurement device. It's called a float and cable or float and tape device. This housing contains a reel of tape and a mechanical indicator. The tape runs from the take up reel and indicator through a pipe into the tank. Inside the tank, the tape is attached to a float. When the level of the liquid rises, the float rises with the liquid. The take up reel reels in the slack tape and the mechanical indicator displays the new liquid level. Electrical probes such as these conductivity probes are another type of direct level measurement device. They're used with liquids that can conduct electricity in order to complete an electrical circuit. As this illustration shows, the conductivity probes are connected to a high and low level alarm. A current flow return path from the tank is also connected to the alarm. The two probes are mounted on top of a tank and they extend to the minimum 
and maximum points to be measured in the tank. As long as the liquid level is between the upper and lower probes, current flows from the low level probe through the liquid and back to the alarm. This is a normal condition, so no alarm is activated. But if the level falls below the lower probe, the circuit is interrupted, the current flow stops, and the low level alarm is activated. The alarm will remain activated until the liquid level returns to normal. Now, if the liquid level rises and contacts the upper probe, a different circuit is completed. As a result, current flows from that probe through the liquid and back to the high level alarm, activating it. Indirect level measurement devices do not measure level directly. Instead, they measure a physical aspect of a liquid that varies in proportion to level. Then, they use that information to provide a level measurement. The physical aspect that's usually measured by an indirect level measurement device is pressure. This illustration shows an example of an indirect liquid level measurement device. It's a gauge mounted at the zero line of a tank. The gauge uses the hydrostatic pressure of the liquid in the tank to indicate the liquid's level. The amount of hydrostatic pressure that's exerted by the liquid depends on the liquid's height. So as the level of the liquid varies, the hydrostatic pressure varies as well. The gauge converts the hydrostatic pressure to a continuous level measurement indication. An indirect liquid level measurement device called a bubbler system uses hydrostatic pressure in a slightly different way. It operates by forcing air out of a pipe that's immersed in liquid. The system consists of a pipe that's open at the bottom and connected at the top to a regulated air supply. There's also a pressure sensitive gauge which is used to indicate level. The opening at the bottom of the pipe is at the minimum level to be measured in the tank. The level of the liquid in the tank can be measured by adjusting the air supply until bubbles slowly come out of the bottom of the pipe. At that point, the air pressure felt by the gauge represents the amount needed to clear the pipe of liquid. The gauge uses the pressure that's exerted on it to provide an indication of the level of liquid above the opening in the pipe. Pressure gauges and bubbler systems are used in applications where the tank is not pressurized. They're not designed to measure the levels of liquids under pressure. However, if a liquid is in a pressurized tank, its level can be determined by using a differential pressure device that's sometimes called a DP cell. A DP cell, like this one, measures the difference between two related pressures. We can see how a DP cell works using this simplified illustration. Here, one side of the DP cell is connected by tubing to the upper part of a tank. The other side of the DP cell is connected to the lower part of the tank, near the bottom. The liquid in the tank exerts hydrostatic pressure on one side of the DP cell. When the tank is pressurized, additional pressure is exerted on the liquid and the DP cell. This additional pressure is also exerted through the tubing from the top of the tank to the other side of the DP cell. The DP cell measures the difference between the combined pressure at the bottom of the tank and the pressure exerted at the top of the tank. That difference is equal to the hydrostatic pressure of the liquid, which can then be converted to a level measurement. In this topic, we talked about what level measurement is, and we discussed two forms of level measurement commonly used in industrial applications, continuous level measurement and single point level detection. We also looked at the basic operation of several different direct and indirect liquid level measuring devices. Now let's try some practice questions. Here's an example of continuous level measurement. In this arrangement, a gauge that's mounted at the zero line of a tank provides an indication of the level in the tank at all times. If the level rises, a pointer on the gauge moves up a scale to indicate the higher level. If the level drops, the pointer moves down the scale. This gauge glass or sight glass is an example of a direct level measurement device. It's a transparent vertical tube that's attached to the side of a tank. It's connected to the tank with pipes at the top and the bottom of the tube. The use of a gauge glass is based on the principle that liquid levels equalize in containers that are connected together. In other words, the liquid is free to move between the tank and the glass. So the level that's visible in the glass is the same as the level in the tank. An indirect liquid level measurement device called a bubbler system 
uses hydrostatic pressure in a slightly different way. It operates by forcing air out of a pipe that's immersed in liquid. The system consists of a pipe that's open at the bottom and connected at the top to a regulated air supply. There's also a pressure sensitive gauge which is used to indicate level. Most plants have miles of piping to carry fluids to and from different pieces of equipment. In many cases, it's important to be able to measure the flow of fluids to determine how much fluid is used, moved, or produced. Fluid flow is a general term that's often used to describe the movement of a fluid, which is a liquid or a gas, from one point to another. A flow meter is a device that's capable of measuring fluid flow. Two types of flow measurements that are often made are flow rate measurements and total flow measurements. Flow rate can be thought of as the amount of fluid that's passing some point at any given time. Total flow, on the other hand, can be thought of as the total amount of fluid that has passed a designated point. Different types of meters can be used to measure flow. For example, this particular meter measures total flow. This meter measures both flow rate and total flow. It measures the flow rate in gallons per minute, and it has a counter mechanism that keeps track of the total flow in gallons. Many kinds of flow meters measure flow by physically separating the fluid into specific quantities that can be counted and passed on. This principle of operation is sometimes called positive displacement, and it involves measuring individual amounts of fluid so that a total flow value can be determined. Since these types of meters, in essence, measure fluid flow directly, We'll refer to them as direct flow meters. This oval gear meter is one example of a flow meter that uses positive displacement to measure total flow. As this simplified illustration shows, there are two oval gears inside of the meter. The flow of the fluid causes the gears to rotate. As they rotate, specific amounts of fluid are trapped in the chambers between the gears and the meter body. So each time the gears rotate, a precise amount of fluid is passed along. If the flow increases, the gears speed up, but they still pass the same precise amount of fluid along with each rotation. A counter mechanism counts each rotation of the gears to determine the total flow of fluid through the meter. Another example of a flow meter that measures flow directly is this nutating disc meter. It gets its name from the action of the disc, which can be seen here. The word nutate means to wobble or roll about an axis of rotation. During operation, the disc rotates much like a slowly spinning top. As the disc rotates, specific amounts of fluid are trapped above and then below the disc. An increase in flow will cause the disc to rotate faster, but the same amount of fluid will be passed along with each rotation. The nutating disc meter counts the precise amounts of fluid passing through it to determine total flow. Some flow meters do not measure the flow of a fluid directly. Instead, they measure some physical aspect of the fluid, such as velocity, pressure, or level, and then convert that measurement into a corresponding flow value. In other words, they provide a flow measurement indirectly. For that reason, we'll call these types of meters indirect flow meters. Here's one example of a device that provides a flow measurement indirectly. In this arrangement, a thin plate with a hole in its center, known as an orifice plate, is used to restrict the flow of fluid through a pipe. When fluid flows through the orifice, the pressure on the upstream side of the plate is greater than the pressure on the downstream side. The difference between the two pressures is proportional to the flow rate of the fluid through the plate. The greater the difference between the two pressures, the greater the flow rate. A differential pressure, or DP cell, measures the difference between the two pressures and converts that value to a flow rate signal. The flow rate signal can be used to provide a local indication, or it can be transmitted to a remote indicating device. Now in this example, an orifice plate was used to create a differential pressure, but other pipeline restrictions can be used to accomplish the same thing. Another type of flow meter that uses differential pressure to measure flow rate is a rotometer. In a rotometer, fluid passes through an inlet and enters a tapered tube. Inside the tube is a plummet or float that acts as a restriction in the flow path of the fluid. Fluid flow through the tube causes a differential pressure to develop across the float. The differential pressure causes the float to rise and fall as flow rate changes. 
The greater the flow rate, the greater the differential pressure and the higher the float rises. If the flow rate decreases, the float drops. The tube has a scale next to it that indicates the rate of flow. Flow rate readings are generally taken at the widest part of the float. Now, not all flow measurement devices are used to measure flow in enclosed passages like pipes. Some are used in open passages. These devices are often called open channel flow devices. One type of open channel flow device uses a weir. A weir is basically a dam with a notch at its top. In this arrangement, the level of the fluid behind the weir is used to determine flow rate indirectly. A weir works like this. When fluid enters the channel, it builds up behind the weir and overflows through the notch. The level in the channel stabilizes when the amount of fluid flowing through the notch equals the amount of fluid entering the channel. If the flow rate of the fluid entering the channel increases, the level behind the weir rises until an equal amount of fluid flows through the notch. So the level of fluid behind the weir is directly related to the flow through the channel. A level measuring device continuously measures the level behind the weir and converts that value to a flow rate signal. The signal is typically transmitted to a recorder where it can be read. Another group of flow meters uses fluid velocity to determine flow rate. Now keep in mind that flow rate and velocity are not the same thing. The flow rate of a fluid is the quantity of fluid that flows past a given point at any given time. Velocity is the speed at which fluid flows. An example of a meter that uses fluid velocity to determine flow rate is a turbine flow meter. As this simplified illustration shows, a turbine flow meter has blades that are attached to a rotor. The rotor is placed in the path of the fluid flow. As fluid passes around the blades, the turbine begins to rotate. The speed of the rotation is proportional to the speed of the fluid. The number of rotations that the turbine makes is converted to an indication of flow rate. In this topic, we talked about what fluid flow is, and we looked at some of the devices commonly used to measure fluid flow. We categorized the devices that we saw as direct flow measurement devices and indirect flow measurement devices. Now let's try some practice questions about flow measurement. Two types of flow measurements that are often made are flow rate measurements and total flow measurements. Flow rate can be thought of as the amount of fluid that's passing some point at any given time. Total flow, on the other hand, can be thought of as the total amount of fluid that has passed a designated point. The nutating disk meter counts the precise amounts of fluid passing through it to determine total flow. When fluid flows through the orifice, the pressure on the upstream side of the plate is greater than the pressure on the downstream side. The difference between the two pressures is proportional to the flow rate of the fluid through the plate. The greater the difference between the two pressures, the greater the flow rate. A differential pressure, or DP cell, measures the difference between the two pressures and converts that value to a flow rate signal. The flow rate signal can be used to provide a local indication, or it can be transmitted to a remote indicating device.